in Chinese, you would say you don't you don't want to piss off the ancestors. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> the ancestors still are in their spirits and give us energy and power, and and we still attribute our knowledge to the ancestors. It's better that we say, okay, we stand on the shoulders of these giants. And we're able to contribute and, and disseminate the information and share the information. But to say you created it yourself, making an image for yourself, you know, uh, making a cult following for yourself. And then when someone, when someone uh, bursts that bubble, pushes that button and says, hey, he didn't create it. He took it from this and this. And then they're like, well, uh, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. or they they deny the fact or he kept the, the the secrets close to his vest he never he never told us where he got it from right and neither did we care to ask right he, he was just sharing with us and i think that's the same thing as in martial arts same thing in medicine same thing in probably anything that comes up mm-hmm. eventually so, and, and in bursting the fantasy you open people up to the historic accuracy so they can go to the source themselves and aren't dependent on individuals Exactly. Uh, well, look at it this way. Even the famous uh, uh, movie star actor who, who introduced Kung Fu to, to the West. Okay. Yeah. I won't mention his name either, right? But he, Kung he Fu was cousin. Right. <laughs> Kung Fu uncle. Uncle. uncle okay. Uncle. Okay. Uh, Kung Fu uncle was, uh, was uh, very, very famous. He, he half learned his Wing Chun, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, first form, second form, half the dummy. Okay, that's what he graduated with, uh, you know, and then came to America. He didn't learn the pole, the knives. He didn't learn the other half of the dummy. He didn't learn the third form, right? He comes here. Nobody knows anything here. It's like, wow, Kung Fu in the 1950s, 60s here. It's like, oh, I never saw it. You know, what, what is it? You know, suddenly he's like the biggest badass. He doesn't give credit to the system. He mm-hmm. just gives it, calls it, names it after himself when he's teaching. And then, you know, and then he's developing and then taking from here and there pieces, but ne- never really cites his source. Yet when he dies, he leaves behind this book and is a book of all these notes. But these notes are not footnoted, nor are they attributed to different authors mm-hmm. whose martial genius that, that is. Right. And that's a major problem in, in a lot of this type of stuff. You know, and then suddenly everyone who's following in his quote unquote lineage is saying, oh, I got the real deal. Oh, he only taught me. He, he really only mm-hmm. taught me. You know, like, yeah, whatever. Lineage doesn't mean that you're good in skill. Mm-hmm. If you didn't work for it, you don't have it. Lineage only means that you might be, you might have been, you might have been exposed to a little bit of real teaching. And that if you got that real teaching, understood it, drilled it so that it's like become a part of you, then you really got it. So mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> it's a very funny, funny world. So you are a Wing Chun master. At what point did you start to go into acupuncture? And you've been studying and teaching all over the world, Master Tongue's acupuncture and classical acupuncture methods. Mm-hmm. Did your study of Wing Chun influence your direction when it came to choosing an acupuncture system to devote your life to? I, w- I would say definitely. I mean, I studied martial arts when I was a little kid. I actually got punished with it. Grandpa, you know, uh, when I was about six, seven years old, I, I woke grandpa up from a nap because I was throwing this coffee lid around like it was a Frisbee and it landed on his face and he got so angry. I never seen grandpa so angry because I woke him up from his afternoon nap and he, he just grabbed me and sat me in a corner and made me sit down in a horse dance, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, what is this Chinese torture, you know, uh-huh. and it's forcing me to, to, to do that. And then, uh, you know, after like, a, like 10 minutes, the legs are wobbling and shaking and then, you know, I'm like all messed up or uh, later on, he's fooling around here, here, pick up this brick, grab it like this, you know, mm-hmm. and, and drop it and catch it again, drop it before it hits the floor. Don't, don't let it hit the floor. And he, he, he does these little things and it's like weird, but then he's, I say, like, Oh, if my hands hurt. I hit this uh, telephone book like this, you know, all the time. What am I supposed to do? He gives me this Chinese uh, medicine. Uh, we know it now, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The orthopedic, but uh, back then it was like this in this red bottle, right? Yeah. <laughs> this, this stuff. Right. And, uh, we're, uh, you know, I rubbed it in. It's like, oh, it's minty. Oh, it feels good. You know, it's like, oh, this is fascinating. What, what the heck is this? And then, you know, I asked him about it and he says, oh, this is uh, Chinese herbs. 
and you put it on and it makes you strong. If you train, train it hard, then you can just break all these bricks and boards and all these funny things. So it's like, you know, it's like practically you're like amazed when you're a kid and you're just like saying, oh, you know, how did, how did they do that? So, you know, I, I know there's a, another doctor, he, he, he reformulated this version, right? Mm-hmm. But this one is very near and dear to me because I, I, I sometimes think, my God, you know, we, you know, we Chinese, you know, we, we created this and, you know, it was really a good product back in, you know, when I was a kid. And now it's not really a good product. You know, this is different, different made. And, and mm-hmm. but in my clinic, you'll still see like gallon jars full of things that I'm, I'm uh, you know, just making into a liniment because, you know, I learned how to make the uh, over the years. Uh, when other kids would trade football cards and baseball cards, uh-huh. I would I would talk to other Chinese kids and say, hey, you learning Kung Fu? Who do you learn from? Master so-and-so. Oh, I tell you what, did the master give you the formula for the the <laughs> the the yeah. trauma liniment right and they would say uh yeah and i said i tell you what i trade you my formula for your formula he goes no way my my seafood's formula is the best right uh, everyone's it's like the best right <laughs> everyone's is the best right? so 80 percent the same <laughs> exactly exactly and then i you know first of all we got it's written in chinese right mm-hmm. so being growing up here in the usa right it's like i i had to learn all the characters and read them and figure out what is this, you know, and then, you know, and then you got to realize at that time in New York Chinatown, where, where I grew up, you know, at home, we spoke Shahanese dialect, right, very close to Mandarin, right, okay. uh, and, and then, uh, but, uh, but like France in Chinatown, they spoke Cantonese, so, uh, you know, my family was in Hong Kong for three generations, so we did speak some Cantonese, but then also, uh, the majority of the Chinese there, even though they're from Southern China, they don't speak Cantonese. They speak Toy San. Yeah. Right. So That's then like they, middle Chinese. Right. Well, they, they really, they really treated us. If we didn't speak Toy San, we weren't mm-hmm. considered Chinese in those days. Really? It was so it's funny. It's pretty close to Cantonese though. It's right? very close. Right. Like yeah. uh, for, for example, Cantonese will say Tong Yang, say Gong Tong Wa, right. It's the, the Chinese who don't speak Chinese. Right. But uh, but Toisan people would say Hong Yan Sik Gong Hong Fa, right? And this is like the accent is a little bit different, mm-hmm. but they treated you like crap if you didn't speak Toisan. Uh-huh. So eventually, I had to learn to speak Toisan. And then, like uh, you know, you're looking at this, Tin uh, Chat, uh, like Tian Chi, right? Mm-hmm. This, uh, right, Field Seven, right? It's, uh-huh. uh, it's a very famous uh, herb, right? So then uh, they call it Tin Chat, and then the other guy is calling it. Achat, and it's like, what the heck is he talking about? But then you realize they're talking about the same herb. It's just a different dialect. And then it's like, the more you hear uh, different things, you're picking up different things. And so after a while, I, I amassed this big book of recipes of paste and syrups and lotions and, uh, you know, tita, jiao formulas and, and things that you would take internally. Uh, and then that always fascinated me. And then, uh, one of my last teachers was this very famous uh, spear and pole master in Chinatown. And because he, he was like in his 80s, when I learned from him, he was very happy because I already had some background in Wing Chun and Hong Kong. And he said, here, I just give you this information. These are the points that you would hit with the pole to kill people. And these are all acupuncture points, right? Mm-hmm. And he goes, here's the medicine to fix them if you want to fix them, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, this way you don't kill them. You just give them the medicine so that you fix them. So when he gave me those books and information, I said, oh, I got to go to acupuncture school. You know, that's the only way to get this herbal knowledge. And so it fueled me, you know. Uh, there's a famous thing that, that makes you understand about in Chinese. Uh, we, we have uh, some sayings, uh, and it's kind of tongue-in-cheek. It's, for example, in scholarship, there's no number one, right? No one is the best in scholarship, but in martial arts, there's no number two, right? Because <laughs> you're not going to say, hey, yeah, my, my teacher, he's the second best master of Wing right. Chun, right? You're going to say, no, he's the best master, right? Mm-hmm. So it's the same thing. But you see, in Chinese, we consider one Wu, one is a scholarship or you know, civil Mm-hmm. civil works and wu is martial works that you're supposed to have two together if you have two you're balanced right but you see then you got scholars i'm the best i'm the smartest no one else can understand better than me <laughs> i'm the most brilliant scholar of all right well scholarship often leads to let's say 
crazy theories that are not proven mm -hmm. or a lot of mental masturbation, right? Yeah. Right? They don't have a grounding in reality because they're just in their head all the time. They don't know practicality. And then martial artists, they have a tendency to be meatheads, Neanderthals, or, you know, uh, in the Japanese have a funny saying, they call karate baka, you know, uh -huh. karate, karate fool. fool. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're crazy about martial arts, but they're just like an idiot. They can't do anything else. So uh, the best thing for me to say is that, uh, you know, when you're doing a, uh, when you're doing martial arts and you're doing medicine, you have to have a mix and they have to come. Your martial fervor and excitement and enjoyment and energy, you put that into your scholarship and you have to be grounded in reality. So for the scholar side, you're grounded in practicality, right? And so that the, the, the two become one, right? And it's very easy that way. And so I have to say, uh, well, number one is martial artists and, and scholars or, or, and, and Chinese medicine practitioners. They have to know where their root is from because it's not just enough to have the theory, right? It's, it's more important to have the principles. And uh, it's not enough to have like, oh, well, you know, we can have this technique or that technique. No, you have to look at the application of it. What is the concept behind it? So... So in Chinese, we call ti and yong, the body and then the application. And actually, these two are one thing too, and they have to come together. And so like some of the contemporaries of Master Dong, their theory is fantastic, but does it work in the clinic, right? So this is, this is the most important thing. And some of those who are in, uh, in, in the clinic, they don't get good results because they have no grounding in theory. They don't, they don't understand the principle. They don't have the body, body of knowledge behind their system to give it to them, All right? And so, you know, we're in, in pursuing an endeavor like Chinese medicine, we have to be practical. You know, if it's not clinically relevant, don't bother to study, All right? If it doesn't make your practice better, Let's say you take a seminar on the weekend and on Monday, you can't go to the class. I mean, you finish the class and you go to the clinic and you try to use the stuff, but it's too complex to use. Then they failed. They didn't give you any takeaways to start. Right. But I, when I teach class, I make sure it's, I got to prove it to you. I have to show it to you. I tell you, this is where the concept came from. This is who it's attributed to. This is a passage in the Ling Shu, the Da Cheng, the, the Su Wen, et cetera, right? Mm -hmm. This is what the Master Dong lineage teaches. And this is how we use it. And this is the effect that we use, you know? It's not just enough to memorize or go through rote memorization. It's a matter of, did I get the body of knowledge and am I able to apply it? And that's the same thing that's consistent through herbs, acupuncture, dita, Chinese martial arts, even Chinese philosophy, you could say. Right, because otherwise it's just a bunch of baloney and hot air. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So with uh, Master Dong acupuncture, you mentioned that there's a very, very deep philosophy that goes in, but then uh, from the surface level, looking at it, it seems very simple. And from everything I've seen and heard, you can also get very accurate results, mm -hmm. very sudden results even using kind of a, almost like a minimalist approach. That's true. That's, that's true. That's, that's exactly the idea. A lot of people are mistaken uh, and they, they're given to very fuzzy words. Okay. Beginner, intermediate, advanced. Mm -hmm. what, what does that mean? You know, uh, I say basics are already advanced. Mm -hmm. Advanced is just basics applied. So, you know, uh, in Master Dong system, for example, we say, look at the channels first, okay? Let's say someone asked me, uh, I have a problem with someone who has Achilles tendon pain. What do I do with it, right? I'll go, okay, if he's got Achilles tendon pain, what are you doing? He goes, well, I'm doing the Dong's points, right? Zhang Jing, right, uh, to treat it. These are points right on the Achilles tendon. So he's using the opposite side. I go, okay, let's take it even more basic, what channels are involved? He goes, the gallbladder and UB channel. I go, okay, gallbladder and UB. Why don't you just use the gallbladder and UB channels? He goes, 
Well, but, but what points? Like, what are good points that would treat pain? Right? Right away, I can give you three points that treat pain. She clap point treats pain and bleeding. Shoe stream point treats pain, right? Ying spring point treats inflammation and pain. Even if you just chose those three based on the channel and you multiply that out by the 12 channels, you already have 36 very good points to use for pain, right? I mean, I don't have to tell you the numbers. You can look them up. Everyone mm -hmm. can look them up, right? But the thing is, everyone's going to say, oh, which point is that? If it's the stomach channel, which point do I use? You know, okay, stomach 34 is the she clef point, right? Stomach 43 is the shoe stream point. Stomach 44 is the ying spring point. And then you do that for every point, you know, UB, okay, UB 63 is she clef point. UB 65 is the shoe stream point. UB 66 is the ying spring point, right? If you get all of that information, it's very practical immediately. And you don't have to think of it. My approach is, uh, I, I teach in seminars around the world, and I've, I've taught in DOM programs. I, I usually don't teach master's programs because the, the students, maybe they just don't have the basics now. Right? And I'm not the best teacher for the basics, right? But I have to say, you know, in teaching them, if I give them the basic concept, then they can make something of it. Then they can start using it clinically. The problem with most students these days is they are going by the Chinese way of learning. What's that? Rote memorization, right? So when they're studying for the exam in the master's program to, to qualify and pass their licensing, they're just cramming all of that information in their head. But they're, they're just doing a data dump. And when they take the exam, they do a data dump outward, right? <laughs> in and out, right? That's it. But they don't have any critical thinking. There's no logical reasoning, right? There's no deductive thought. There's nothing of the sort that will help them, you know? And so as a result, then Chinese medicine is very baffling to them, right? And I think that's the same thing with, with uh, when you compare it to martial arts, it's the same thing because many people learn blocks, different hand techniques, different maneuvers, but they don't know how to put it together, you know? So then they get lost in, in, in all of that. But it should be like logical thinking and deductive thought that will allow them to to come to uh, the, the proper application that will fit at the right moment. You don't use your mind. You, you, once you have this internalized, they're just like very fast. It just flows very fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so anyway. the Ling Shu and Nei Jing, when they talk about some of these concepts, it's the principle and the time of year. You're yes. kind of like, this is how you have a reflective action. Like basically this is how the wheel turns. This is how the sphere rotates based on the time of year. Here's the principle and then apply that contextually and flexibly. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, definitely. Because when you're using the atmospheric conditions and then these are equated to the five shoe points, right? You'll know how to apply which five shoe points uh, at all time. But let's just say, you know, just like we learned the pentagram in five elements chart, right? We shouldn't think of the pentagram as the five elements chart. I always make fun, you know, because pentagram is for Satanists. And, and uh, you know, we should think of more of the cross. And, and that would be more of the Hatu, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Right? So the, yeah. in the Hatu, we know on that one. The, the one that hits the center is Earth. Right. And that would be long, long summer. Right. Uh -huh. And so long summer, it hits every season. So if we know there's got to be something that can hit at all seasons, then the shoe stream points are the ones that can hit all, all the seasons. Mm -hmm. And that's the fun thing, because when we start to understand, well, the ancients were giving us principles and they were lying, uh, you know, laying it out for us in, in terms of dialogue where we were flies on the wall to listen to two learned people speak like Chi Bo and Huang Di speak, mm -hmm. right? And then they were getting lessons and it's like, wow, I can sit on the, I can sit on the wall and listen to this conversation. I can't believe what I'm hearing, you know? And this guy is giving the, he's elucidating all the deep secrets, you know? And that's, that's the typical Chinese way of teaching, you know, is a, there's a dialogue. It's very Socratic in that, mm -hmm. in that sense. And it's very different than just mem rote memorization that, uh, you know, I guess Americans are, are used to now. Uh, maybe the Japanese have, have this thought too, right? But, it's, but ancient Chinese 
it was a very philosophical approach, very Socratic way. I have a case study, I have a problem, let's discuss this, let's break this down, how could I use this? How can I bring this information? And where are the clinical pearls? Where are the clinical gems? We always have to look for those things. And kind of an expectation that you're gonna use some inductive reasoning, like Zhui Fan San from 103. So yes. you, you get the idea, you should be able to take off with it. Brilliant. That's that's exactly it. Because we have to learn, we have to learn the standard method. Then we have to apply it alive, and then from the alive method, then we know there are variations. Bian fa, right? Mm -hmm. right? It's like from one to ten thousand. Right? One is the mother of everything. Right? So then we can go up to ten thousand from there. Right? So you know, it's the myriad. Uh, breakdowns of yin and yang, right? So we, mm -hmm. we, we can understand and then grow from there. And I think a lot of uh, Chinese medicine, uh, young ones, uh, new practitioners, they have no grounding in Chinese medicine uh, concepts. Like they don't understand the numerology system from zero to 10, mm -hmm. right? If they understood what those stood for and how to, to change them, you know, then they would understand uh, you know, what's a, what's a good way to, to grow in the metaphysical sense, right? The Chinese metaphysical sense is because it's very practical. I think if, even if we take it uh, from every sense, you know, first, uh, let's say I would think of Wuji, which is zero, okay? Mm -hmm. I don't have any expectations for my patient. I'm just meeting a new patient for the first time. I have to be at Wuji state. Wuji state mm -hmm. is my mind is clear. I don't have any expectations. I have no attachments. I, I don't know what's going on. I have to be open and I don't have preconceived ideas. I, I just let them talk. You know, for example, in, in the old days as, as a student in acupuncture school, we had a you know 10 page questionnaire that we would interrogate <laughs> the patient with, right? That's because we didn't have anything to go by, we didn't have the knowledge mm -hmm. and experience, but then after a while, I just threw that away. So I said, okay, what could I help you with? And I just shut up. Mm -hmm. Or what brings you to the clinic today? And then I just shut up. Or how could I help you? You know? And then because when you're quiet at that zero stage, then that's the, the point of change from Wuji to Taiji, mm -hmm. right? And so that's zero to one. Right. So once they start to tell me the complaints, right, and then share with me, and then I probe a little bit deeper. So now the one, I'm breaking it down into yin yang, right? And then yin yang can further be broken down to yin yang. And then yin yang can be changed into yin yang. So uh, then I'm, I'm, that's going from one to two, right? And then is it the upper, middle, or lower jaw that you have a problem? That's three. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then with yin yang, you know, I might have the four limbs. Okay. And that could be si xiang, the four mm -hmm. corners in a way. Right. So yeah. that's four. And then five is the five elements or the five zhang organs. Right. And then I start to understand which channels and which zhang and which fu are, you know, are in there. And then six is the, the fu organs. Right. So then I can consider it. Seven might be the seven joints that you have. Eight is the, the bagua is the changes within all of them what's what's going on with the lifestyle because you know we look at bagua and we can look at natural phenomena around us but we can also look at relationships between a family and professional mm -hmm. and working because these these tell us everything about what's this bagua's ma matrix and mm -hmm. from there we can see where is this problem in this patient so then we can overlay the nine palaces, which is where your organs are, right? And we could do abdominal diagnosis or we can just touch them or we could see where do they need balancing at, okay? Between the limbs and the torso uh, and so on. And then, you know, then we do our completion, the 10, right? Where we start to do treatment, that's the application. And from the application, we go back to Wuji again, where we're empty. So mm -hmm. that's it in a nutshell, a quick nutshell, without being too, too uh, overly metaphysical or complex, uh, you know, but you can see from zero to 10 to zero again, mm -hmm. we, we, we just 
empty and then allow the patient to lie on the table and get the healing that they, they want. Uh, we, we don't give healing. Uh, one thing a lot of practitioners do, they think mm-hmm. they're a God. I can heal that. Yeah. I could fix that. Right? No, we, we give a little stimulus and the body fix itself. We help them because we interpret their signs and symptoms and we try to give a little stimulus and then the body orients itself and fixes itself. And then that's it. No. So, you know, I don't want to have any God complex or I don't want to have any, any type of uh, logical. I always want to bring my mind back to Wuji. You know, mm-hmm. don't, don't, don't try to be Taiji, everything. Don't have monkey mind, everything. Right. And go back to Wuji and center. Like you, you're you're so peaceful. I look at you, you're so calm and peaceful. So well, yeah. I'm just listening. That's <laughs> <laughs> well, that's Wu Ji. That is the yeah. point of Wu Ji. Yeah, so it's great. That's very actionable, though, for acupuncturist, any kind of medical practitioner to look through those lenses and do that as their own practice, so that they don't get caught up in, you know, there's there's so much transference. There are there's negativity that comes up just if somebody pushes on your leg and it's painful, you can have a negative or angry reaction toward the person. Mm -hmm. So having that sense of having that strong sense of self or a strong presence there can allow patients to either hate you or fall in love with you and Mm -hmm. having, and really get kind of stuck to you that way, rather than being more centered in themselves and just being there for the healing. It -hmm. can become very personal Mm -hmm. and that's always scary and gross when that happens because nothing, nothing, I've never found anything good comes of that. So Mm. interesting. So when, and why did you begin, uh, Itara? Is that how you pronounce it? Yes. Itara. Yeah. Um, I, in 2004, um, I started to introduce, uh, uh, my own series of seminars. I wanted to spread, uh, the information of Dong's acupuncture. And I didn't want to do it in the way that other people were doing it. Other people were constantly just doing, um, okay, here's a bunch of points and this is how we use it. And we only talk about the points and then, you know, you try to practice the points and then see how effective the points are. And and Master Dong this and Miriam that, and, you know, so-and-so teacher this, you know, Master Dong was like this, and you know, oh, you know, Master Dong could walk on water. Master Dong could hold his hand out and, and warm all of you in the dead of wood. It's like it became ridiculous. Mm-hmm. So I just said, you know, okay, look, there were three phases in Master Dong's life. Master Dong first used regular acupuncture points, but he used them with imaging methods and interrelationship of channels. Okay, so he used that way first. And then other acupuncturists started to copy him after, you know, several years. So he pulled out his Dong family points. Nobody could copy him. There was one guy who took his work and, and wrote a book and published it. In Taiwan? Yeah, yeah in Taiwan. Yeah. And uh, actually, yeah, <laughs> actually uh, didn't give Master Dong credit at all. Right. Well, that led to a lawsuit. Right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but that guy finally skipped town and, you know, he went and retired in Hong Kong, right? Which was very interesting, right? But, uh, you know, Master Dong himself, you know, he was kind of a low-key guy, not a big fighter, you know, is, is a good, good healer. So, uh, you know, I, I think he just let things go. And, you know, people just started to rip him off left and right. Well, the sad thing at his li- at the end of his life was, you know, Master Dong was not a scholar. He grew up during a very tumultuous period of the Sino-Japanese War and the and the uh, nationalist and communist civil war, and he was part of the Kuomintang, the Republic of China. So he didn't get a lot of education. He's he wasn't well read in the Lingshu or the Suwen or anything else like that. So people just started ripping him off left and right. And uh, towards the end of his life, he was left almost penniless. Jeez. All right. And so I said, you know, this is my grand teacher. I can't just let him, his memory just go like that. You know, I have to tell people because uh, I've experienced his work. If, if a guy like me who grew up here in America can see his work is and how much he should get credit for it, then I feel like I should just bring up and teach his teach at least the basics that I know that would help everyone understand 
it's not just the Dong family points, guys. Okay, so I was talking about three phases. The first phase is he used regular acupuncture points, but with imaging and interrelationship of channels. Second was he used the Dong family points. Third one, he freely combined the Dong family points with everything. Mm-hmm. Okay. I teach all three three levels, but most people only fixate and teach the second level. And I don't feel that they were doing a good good enough job. And so when I came out with uh, ITARA in 2004, I, I wanted to make sure, hey, we, let's teach the basics. Imaging, 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 and uh, interrelationship of the channels. Okay? Master Dong is the guy who made this up. Okay? He's the one who used it. He's the one who conceptually... Uh, had it in his teachings and his, his 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 methods. You know, there were specific methods of his pricking and bloodletting. Okay, that he used. Okay, let's give him credit where credit is due, so that his memory. Not everyone can. You know, everyone nowadays in the acupuncture world can say, "Oh, Master Dong, yeah, he was great." You know, they often mention Dong and the other guy. Okay, but what they should say is, "It's Master Dong's work." because he precedes that other guy's work, you know, by a generation. And, but the thing is, you see, just like towards the end of his life, Master Dong was ripped off. And I feel in a way, I owe it to my grand teacher that he doesn't get ripped off. He should be known for the great things that he taught. He should have credit for where credit is due. He should be attributed the, you know, the true information, you know? And so that's what, that's what ITARA was for. It was mm. so that, International Don't Acupuncture Research Association, we could understand it, how we would apply it. Even though Master Dong taught those three levels, I don't think it's uh, complete. His, his clinical experience is gonna be different than my clinical experience, okay? I don't use 26 gauge needles, I use 38 gauge needles. Does it work? Yes, it works. Others in Dong system do freehand. I use a guide tube and very thin needles. Does it work? Yes, it works, right? Master Dong used uh, his own ear acupuncture points, but does Master Dong's points work in conjunction with Nojir's ear points? Well, let's research it. And that's where I wanted to do is take phase three of Master Dong's teachings and make sure that that's spread and that we can evenly understand and pass that on. And that, that was the whole purpose of mine, is to standardize, is to share openly. I don't, I don't try to have, oh, in the Dong family, they point at each other and they say, hey, this guy's no good. That guy's no good. Mm-hmm. Sound familiar, right? Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't say that. I, I try not to say that. I said, okay, you know, this guy has a different experience. He's obviously added certain things. The, the Dong seniors that I've seen and studied their work, they have this set of points, but they don't have a lot of these extra points. Where did these extras come from? Okay. And well, they generally come from this other practitioner in Taiwan. And then, well, where did he get it from? Well, Master Dong said, well, you can name it yourself, whatever you want to call it. So then he gave it a name and then he he attributed it to Dong. So it makes it seem like everyone else in the Dong family has less points than that guy. And Mm -hmm. he got the most points, right? (laughs) Well, this guy's just in his clinic trying to help people who ask. And he's like, yeah, you can do this. And they're like, that was what Jesus said on this day. <laughs> Probably like, hey, you can do either way. Just... <laughs> there you go. Let's see. Someone get me a sandwich I haven't eaten. Since. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it gets to be like that. So everyone takes their, their teacher's words as gospel. And it's like, he's just like thinking, whatever. I don't care. Name it whatever you want to. But then, so well, who's your teacher? Dong. Master Dong was my teacher. It's true. Dong is his teacher. But did Dong really pass on those things? I don't think so. Because mm-hmm. we know what he passed on, you know? We have it. It's written. And that's popular to do in Chinese martial arts too, right? Uh, like you learn a little something and you say, oh, yeah, yeah, no, that was my famous grand teacher taught me uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu kung fu. Like, Come <laughs> on, man. I, we saw you in the dojo. <laughs> like, knock it off. <laughs> There's a lot of embellishments everywhere. And, right. then, you know, that's because why? Because, you know, people don't have integrity or people want to make themselves different or they want to stand out or, you know they're coming to market with something different. I don't know, mm-hmm. you know, it's puffery or, you know, you know, whatever, you know, people, people just want to do their thing. Well, what can you say? You know, yeah. Sometimes you just got to be like this. <laughs> I don't want to see it. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's like, okay, whatever, do what you want to. 
Fair enough. How is uh, Master Dong's family doing now? As you mentioned, he had a hard time toward the end of his life. Yes. Are they doing okay? Uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't have any connection. Uh, from what I heard from my teacher was uh, Master Dong's son uh, pursued a uh, uh, different career in, in I don't know, um, mechanics or, or radio or television things. I'm not even sure, not hundred percent sure. You know, as I understand, he, he does different types of electronics in Taiwan. So I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. One thing I have to say is you see Master Dong, he passed away when, uh, when his son was six. Mm -hmm. So I don't think his son was old enough or, you know, I don't, was it six or 12? I don't know for sure. Okay. I don't remember, but uh, there's this blue poppy book that was going around saying that, oh, uh, you know, Master Dong passed, uh, passed away without passing on his system to his son. Oh, is the son is a little boy. He doesn't have any interest in acupuncture. You know, he wants sure. to go get ice cream and play with Lego. What, what the heck does he want to do with acupuncture, right? Whereas, you know, in Master Dong's time, from the time he was from 6 to 16, he was allegedly with his father in the clinic. And there's no video games back then. They didn't have, you know, Nintendo. They didn't have anything of the sort, right? Mm -hmm. So he had to assist his father. And his father says, this is uh, the Sima points, right? Uh, and this is the exact location of it. This is how you measure it. This is how you find it, okay? So then he asked the son next time, hey, what is this point? Oh, Sima, okay, good, right? I don't have to slap you today, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Whatever, you know, the old Chinese teaching method is the, uh -huh. <laughs> the uh, right hand slaps, <laughs> slaps you on the head and then you've got all these bumps on your head and like, you're yeah, dead. <laughs> you know? So I, I think it was unfair to, for the Blue Pocky book mm -hmm. to say, you know, uh, he wasn't a worthy son, so he couldn't learn. Right? I, I don't think no, it's I, I didn't mean that at all. I was just thinking of how many people have benefited from his work and I'm just throwing it out there. If you mm -hmm. have benefited from Master Dong's work and, uh, you know, you know who his family is in Taiwan, just please check. Make sure everything's good. If God forbid something isn't good. And if you know somebody who can help him out, that would be a way of honoring his legacy a little bit and saying thank you. Just to check and make sure that his family is uh, doing well and that that respect is being carried forward toward him and his descendants. That's wonderful, but I'll tell you, Andrew, what what is really the the best thing is to give credit where credit is due. Absolutely, and you know, I don't want to hear people say so and so made up this method and is uh, you know is uh, is passed on his legacy because it is Master Dong's legacy. It should be fair, and that will will is more than enough because to honor our ancestors, right? Like I said, when you drink water, you think of the source, then we know we, we honor the, the master himself. You know, it's like when I do Yijing acupuncture, I think of my teacher, Chen Zhang. He was the creator of it, right? Not this other guy who popularized it and brought, the, brought his system out, right? But it was Chen Zhang who, he told me, he meticulously read the Yijing, he studied acupuncture, he wanted to make them come together. Mm -hmm. He was thinking that there is some sort of relationship between the Yijing and acupuncture, right? And then he created that, that relationship. He even had a friend who, was, uh, who had a family system based on the Yijing, but his friend wouldn't tell him anything. Why? Because mm -hmm. his last name is not the same last name as him. So mm -hmm. I'm not going to teach you, right? This is only for my family. So, but he figured it out. And when he figured it out, his friend said, yes, that's exactly, that's our family's teachings and legacy. That's yeah, how did you figure out? He goes, mm -hmm. I just got, got the inspiration. I understood it. And even like Dr. Chen, when I was take, talking to him, I said, Master, how did you learn all of this this way? He goes, I'll tell you something. When I read these books, it was like reading them again. And that he goes, I feel that uh, I am a, a reincarnation of Xiao Yong. Right? Uh, Xiao Yong was, uh, is the creator of the Mei Hua Yi. Mm. The plum blossom divination method of, 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 uh, of the I Ching. And he says, it was so simple for me to figure it out and understand it, the logic and reasoning behind it, right? You know, why I don't teach I Ching acupuncture? Because my Mei Hua Yi is not good enough. 
I don't look at everything as I Ching, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe because I'm too much of a modern person, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, I think if I simplify my brain and just put myself into that mode, then I can think, ah, oh, you know, this, I can make these calculations. And based on the calculations, I can figure out the acupuncture points to balance people out, right? Mm -hmm. And so he, he has it. He remembered all 64 hexagrams. If not, he could count the hexagrams on, his, on his fingers, fingers and, yeah. Yeah, and, and just school. do it. And it's like, whoa, how, how does he do it? You know, that's real skill. That was mm -hmm. like amazing. We don't, we don't have that skill these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, the people who are teaching aging acupuncture, I wonder, you know, have they cultivated that much, you know? And then uh, Dr. Chen's son, you know, succeeds him. I'm, I was just one of his students, right? Mm -hmm. I was lucky to see a piece of the pie. Maybe his son has the, the full depth of knowledge, you know? So me, you know, Confucius said he wished he had, what, uh, 70 more years to study the Yi Jing. Uh -huh. I understand what Confucius means by that, you know, because it was very difficult mm -hmm. uh, to study the Yi Jing. And, you know, I, I've read all the works on it, but it's still, you know, it's very, very deep, you know, and it's continued scholarship, you know, definitely. Mm -hmm. Uh, so anyway absolutely you were mentioning before some of your classes on teachable can you explain or introduce us a little bit to yes okay um i taught several classes in the last year because of covid and that we're on lockdown and so uh whereas i couldn't go out and train people on my usual uh forums then uh what what we did was we talked about a specific topic of how to treat certain things and then shared with people all the basic principles and concepts and then explain how we arrive at our logic of how to treat certain disorders. So I might have some disorders on knee pain and ankle pain and elbow pain and so on. Or maybe I'm talking about the imaging method and then the basic concept of master dome. We have about six to eight classes on Teachable. I can't remember. I'll, I'll give you the link and then you can mm -hmm. take a look at it. And this was in the last year. And then also in the last few years, because I was uh, going about and teaching, um, you know, I started to do something that was different than the other Dong teachers. Again, I didn't, didn't want to just give people a formula answer book. I wanted to give people the basic principles and understanding of the Dong system. So I wrote six books in the last year. Uh, basic Primer on Master Dong's, the Pain book, Internal Medicine book, the best of Master Dong's acupuncture, uh, clinical application of Master Dong's acupuncture. And then uh, in the last couple of years, I finished a, a book called Chinese Medicine Traumatology. So I brought together my complete study of, of Di Da and, mm -hmm. and, and traumatology medicine, and then combined it with the Dong's points for you know, acute conditions. So uh, that's what I did. And those books are available on amazon.com. So they could just do a search on Robert Chu acupuncture and they'll see all my six books there. 